Hello, Mile High Con 52. My name is Marie Desjardins. I am a local science fiction and fantasy author, and I would like to uh, read to you a little bit today about animals. Uh, animals have been a big part of my life. Uh, I've always had them since I was uh, a young girl, all kinds of things from gerbils and rats and hamsters and rabbits and guinea pigs to salamanders and fish and you know, the normal dogs and cats and so on. Um, just thinking about how important animals have been in my life, I would like to share a little something from Ursula K. Le Guin, the Wizard of Earthsea novel. And this is where our wizard, Ged, has been overcome by a shadow. And he's been left in the cot to see if he's going to live or die because the village witch couldn't heal him. And so this little excerpt I'd like to read you just from her work. It concerns a pet that he had, a little otak, which is just a little kind of a rodenty creature that would sit on his shoulder and ride with him. The little otak was hiding in the rafters of the house, as it did when strangers entered. There it stayed while the rain beat on the walls and the fire sank down, and the night wearing slowly along left the old woman nodding beside the hearth pit. Then the otak crept down and came to Ged where he lay stretched stiff and still upon the bed. It began to lick his hands and wrists, long and patiently, with its dry leaf brown tongue. Crouching beside his head, it licked his temple, his scarred cheek, and softly his closed eyes. And very slowly, under that soft touch, Ged roused. He woke, not knowing where he had been or where he was or what was the gray light in the air about him, which was the light of dawn coming to the world. Then the Otak curled up near his shoulder as usual and went to sleep. Later, when Ged thought back upon that night, he knew that had none touched him when he lay thus spirit lost, had none called him back in some way, he might have been lost for good. It was only the dumb, instinctive wisdom of the beast who licks his hurt companion to comfort him. And yet in that wisdom, Ged saw something akin to his own power, something that went as deep as wizardry. From that time forth, he believed that the wise man is one who never sets himself apart from other living things, whether they have speech or not. And in later years, he strove long to learn what can be learned in silence from the eyes of animals, the flight of birds, the great slow gestures of trees. The piece that I'd like to read to you today is a story that comes out of my own uh, youth as I was growing up in Florida. And it concerns one of my favorite animals of all, a dolphin. This scene is from the beginning of the book, where fisherman Farl and his son Corlim admire a beautiful dolphin dancing in the sunlight as their fishing boat leaves port. They had just ended the day's successful fishing when the sky rumbled. Clouds that had massed over the island peak suddenly broke free. The storm front poured down the mountain and across the bay obscuring the land with a gray wall of rain. Farl quickly stowed the net. Button up that hold, son. We'll try to make port. Corlum slammed shut the lid and tied down the latch. The boat, heavy with skimmers, rowed low. The sails flapped in a gusty breeze, the moist air eerily quiet between puffs of wind. Secure the boom! His father hurried to trim the mainsail. A few fat drops of rain pattered onto the wooden deck. Corlin was still wrapping the line when the storm hit them like a thunderclap. The heavy boat turned sideways to the wind, and a wave broke across her. Corlin stumbled, but kept a hold of the line. Bracing himself against the receding water, he again tried to lash the boom. The sky let go, soaking Corlin's hair and clothes like a poured bucket. A faint voice penetrated the roar of the storm. Corlum spied his father at the mainmast. Farl gestured toward the mainsail, but the wind whipped his words away. A new wave knocked Corlum clean over. He grabbed for the gunnel and gripped it against the pull. Blinking salt water from his eyes, Corlum saw the boom was trying to jib. In a moment, the line would come loose, leaving the boat to the mercy of the storm. 
Corlum lunged toward it, but a wave caught him broadside. He snatched again for the gunnel and missed. Corlum plunged into cold silence. I'm in the water, he thought. His body rolled with the surge. Disoriented, he kicked toward what he thought was the surface. Too late, he realized he was beneath the boat. He flailed, but the churning sea drove him forward. He smacked into the hull, and sparks shot behind his eyes. Corlum drifted, limbs spread. Although dazed, some part of his mind nagged at him to hold his breath, although he couldn't remember why. The crash of the storm was muffled below the waves. The wind a faint memory. It was cold and quiet, peaceful. Currents buffeted his unresisting form. Something butted his stomach. Corlum gasped in reflex, taking in a mouthful of water. He clapped a hand over his face to stop himself from breathing in more. The thing nudged him in the ribs. Still fighting to breathe, Corlum felt himself rising. His head broke the surface, the wind instantly lashing him with stinging spray. He managed one ragged cough before a wave shut off his air once more. His burning chest bucked with need. The thing brushed him again, and this time Corlum grabbed it. It was slippery and smooth. Its rounded shape and firm, cool skin told him that this was a creature who belonged in the water as much as he did not. His trailing fingers met the edge of a dorsal fin and clasped tight. He rode once more to the surface. At the first touch of air, his lungs spasmed. Helplessly, he clung to his deliverer, racking out painful, watery coughs his body trying to push seawater out and air in all at the same time. At last, the fit subsided. Shivering, Corlum clung to his rescuer and looked around. He couldn't see more than a few yards in the chop and spray. He had no idea where the boat was. He sank lower in the water, pressing his cheek against what he knew to be dolphin skin. As if sensing his submission, the dolphin began to swim, keeping to the troughs of the waves. A white cat bristled overhead. As the crest approached, her blowhole closed. Taking his cue from her, Corlum held his breath and pressed close to her side. She dived, not deeply, only enough to duck the peak of the wave. The crest passed, and she surfaced again. Another wave, another brief trip under the silent water. Over and over they did this, while the storm raged on. After a while, Corlum almost forgot he was a land creature. Air and water, water and air, that was all there was. Lulled by the rhythmic movement, he was taken by surprise when the dolphin ducked away. Desperately, he grabbed after her. Then one of his feet struck bottom. With a shock, he realized he could distinguish the growl of breakers. Before him gleamed a strip of sand. Beyond it rose an indistinct shape that could only be the forested mountain, obscured by rain. A breaking wave bowled him over, tumbling him like driftwood. He scrabbled at the sand, trying to dig in against the suck of the retreating wave. The next breaker drove him forward again, ramming his chin against the ground. Again he fought the undertow, then scrambled frantically forward with the next wave. After that, it was shallow enough for him to crawl. Shivering in every limb, Corlim dragged himself from the sea. Water frothed around him, tugging at his hands and knees. Too weary to raise his head, Corlim kept crawling until the waves ceased and the breakers became no more than an angry rattle behind. His limbs buckled and his cheek hit earth. The sand was cold and hard. Utterly spent, he stared at the blur of the woods. The rain fell in sporadic bursts, stinging his back and arms. The storm was blowing itself out. His eyelids fluttered and he drifted off, dreaming of voices from the sea. When the darkness receded, it was quiet and calm. Corlum was lying in a bed, wrapped in woolen blankets. The mattress was softer than the tick he was used to. That must be what made him dream of floating. The smell of tallow spoke of home, as did the hiss of flame in a metal cup. Corlum, are you awake? The female voice floated over him. Something was wrong, beyond the strange bed and voice. A thick scent of herbs and soap wafted over him. The pillowcase was stiff but clean. He forced gummy eyes to open. 
He recognized the place immediately. It was the healer's room. He'd seen it only once before, the night his mother died. Tallow had been burning then, too. These things you don't forget. The sturdy shutters were latched. Rain tapped on the walls and roof. Misha the healer perched on a chair by the bed, a candle flickering beside her on the wooden nightstand. Her dark curly locks escaped her colorful scarf. Her dark eyes were intense. Corlum lad, can you hear me? He blinked in affirmation. You'll be all right once you're warmed up. It's exhaustion more than anything. But I have to ask, was your father with you when you came ashore? Corlum stared at her, too numb to understand. Everyone in the village turned out, Misha went on, when the boat didn't come in. Can you tell me, was Farl swimming with you? Might he have come up on the same beach? Corlum struggled for speech. I fell over. You went overboard? Corlum nodded. Misha's look softened, and she patted him reassuringly. Then just rest easy. We'll wait for any news. Corlum frowned. Something wasn't right. He whispered, Boat not in? Misha's deliberate calm terrified him. Don't trouble yourself, lad. They're scouring every bit of the shore. I'm sure they'll find... Her words grew distant and hard to hear. He knew. Somehow, while still in the ocean, he had known. When he had come up for air that first time and looked around, he knew. He hadn't been able to find his father's boat, because there had been nothing to find. The storm had taken it. All that remained was the voice of the sea, shouting at him as he shivered on an icy shore that his father had never reached. Corlum stayed with Misha for the next two days. When he finally emerged, pinched with grief, the villagers avoided his gaze. Corlum knew it was his place to make the declaration, but he couldn't face his father's death yet. Instead, on unsteady legs, he made his way down the stone-cobbled path to the sea. The boom and shush of breakers announced his destination before he could see it. Corlum paused at the brink of the long, last slope. He hadn't known what reaction he'd have to the sight of the gray water that had taken his father's life. Now, looking at it, he still didn't know. It was just a beach, empty like he was, but not lifeless. Corlum's eyes narrowed as he gazed upon the ruffled sea. Something moved among the waves. Numbly, Corlin walked down to meet it. The dolphin was about twenty yards out. The dorsal fin was sporadically visible, often absent for several long breaths. There was no jumping today. The gray body skimmed beneath the surface, fast and smooth. It wasn't until Corlum had walked right into the surf that he could see the old scars, puckered and white, that marked the dolphin as the same who had seen them away. He hunched against the breeze. Why, dolphin? Between the two of us, why did you save me? The sleek form made no answer. She swam closer now, studying him with a dark, intelligent eye. It's my fault. I didn't secure the line. The boat foundered because of me. She seemed to smile at him, but Corlum was not fooled. She was simply made that way, her grin built in. That would be him for the rest of his life an automatic smile with nothing behind it. He waded into the surf, but the dolphin remained close. She swam circles about him, her dark eyes teasing. Corlum held out a hand, but she flirted just beyond his reach. Tipped on her side, she appraised him mockingly. It was then that he noticed the glint of gold in her jaws. Corlum suddenly felt lightheaded. The thing she carried was a watch, its curved side and golden gleam unmistakable in the dolphin's pointed teeth. She was carrying Dad's watch. Corlum swayed. Where did she find it? How would she know, of all the possible mementos of his father, 
that this was the most precious. As if waiting for that moment of recognition, the dolphin jerked her head. The watch arched toward Corlum. By reflex, he snatched it out of the air. Amazed, he turned up his palm. There was no question it was his father's pocket watch. The chain was still attached, and the familiar fob swung to and fro over the water. How often had he seen that mother-of-pearl face, and the gold numbers scribed delicately around the edges. The surface had been scratched by her teeth, but the marks could be polished out. The metal was so cold it burned his hand. The hands read 545, the time of the storm. Corlum popped the crystal open and tipped the watch. Water dribbled into the sea. The timepiece would need to be cleaned. Reverently, he shut the glass. The dolphin had moved off again. She was now cavorting in the waves, for all the world just another dolphin playing in the surf. He watched her out of sight, then silently retraced his steps to the village. So that's the first part of my story called The Dolphin in the Deep. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you enjoy Mile High Con 52. Thank you for your time. Take care.